exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible, with your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 82 of How to Be, with me, Shashiti, as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. A protest is an event or action where people gather with others to publicly express their opinions about something that is happening in society. There are a variety of potential goals for a protest. Influencing public opinion. Drawing attention to and sharing information about a perceived injustice. Gaining a wide audience for the cause. Pushing public policy or legislation forward. Learning more about an issue. Connecting with others who feel passionate about the issue. Speaking one's truth and bearing witness. Protests can also provide inspiration and a sense of being part of a larger movement. The overarching purpose of protests is to demand change. Protest is an invaluable way to speak truth to power. Throughout history, protests have been the driving force behind some of the most powerful social movements, exposing injustice, abuse, demanding accountability, and inspiring people to keep hoping for a better future. So why should we protest? Here is Puneet Singh, who is the founder of SS Start, an organisation working towards a more inclusive and accessible society for people with disabilities. His life is an intersection of poverty, domestic violence, and multiple disabilities. It's really important for someone like me, who has multiple disabilities, who's coming out of poverty and have been a domestic violence survivor, protest and to raise my voice is all what I have. And it is my effort to show support to the people who are coming from marginalized communities because we want to show the world that we exist and things have been not changing much for us. We are still struggling for our rights. We are still struggling for what we call equity. We are still suffering and struggling to get what is ours, to reclaim our right, to reclaim our public space, to reclaim all that is ours. Our first book is from Selina Godden, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, is an award-winning author, poet and broadcaster based in London. In 2021, Canongate Gate published her highly acclaimed debut novel, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. It won the Indie Book Award for Fiction, and was the winner of the People's Book Prize 2022. It was also shortlisted for the British Book Awards, the Bad Form Magazine Book of the Year shortlist, and the Gordon Byrne Prize. Film and TV rights to this unique debut novel have been taken by Idris Elba and Green Door Pictures. Her work has been widely anthologised and broadcast on BBC Radio and TV. Her essay Shade was published in the groundbreaking anthology The Good Immigrant, published by Unbound the editor who we have interviewed and showcased the book in season two. A short story, Blue Cornflowers, was shortlisted for the fourth estate in the Guardian Short Story Prize. She has had several volumes of poetry published, including Under the Pier, Fishing in the Aftermath, Poems 1994 to 2014, and also a literary childhood memoir, Springfield Road. She has produced four studio albums to date, her solo poetry album, Livewire, Nymphs and Thugs, was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Prize. A new hardback edition of Pessimism is for Lightweights, 30 Pieces of Courage and Resistance, was published in February 2023 by Rough Trade Books, and the poem version is on the permanent display at the People's History Museum, Manchester. Godden is currently working on three new books for Canongate, one of which is the eagerly anticipated new fiction novel set in the Mrs. Death Mrs. Death World. Three new titles will be published by Canongate in 2024 and 2025. We talked about Pessimism is for Lightweights. Find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. But here is a snippet and the special poem read by the author. Let's start nice and warm. This is Welcome to Hope. Here's your map, she says. This is where you always are. See here, the mountains of vivid life. Make a boat of books. Read them all. Sail down this mighty dream river through forests of wonder. Look how the trees grow ever good. 
how the sky holds its own. Nature is so loud in her gardening. Your soul is your compass. Kindness isn't at the border. Caring is not the city, but change is in the wind, and wild is the weather. Home is a feeling, and now is where we are. She nudges me awake. Welcome to hope. She sings, welcome to hope. Get up, get up, get up. Hope is here, and love knows we have so much to do. Pessimism is for lightweight, so there's many, many, many answers to this, as you can imagine. It's, it's grown and it's grown and it's grown. The poem started life as a poem for the author John Higgs. And John Higgs is a fantastic writer. He's so wise. He's such an amazing social commentator and historian. And, and he just says, I just love the way his brain works. And I was at one of his talks, and in his talk, he says, pessimism is for lightweights. And I thought, wow, what a line. And then he was doing a book called Watling Street. And Watling Street is the oldest road, one of the old one of the oldest roads in Britain. It goes all it's almost like a, a the, the spine of England. It goes all the way up from Dover all the way up. And it was a book about Watling Street. So the road that's being referred to in that poem, This Road is Made of Protest, is Watling Street. I'm referring to the old road that was there before, before, before times. So John asked me to write a poem for his Watling Street podcast. And I said, only if I can call it Pessimism is for Lightweights. And that's where the poem began. But, the, but what does Pessimism is for Lightweights, the phrase, mean to me? I think it's been very easy nowadays to be quite sort of cynical and pessimistic and sarcastic. And that's seen as intelligence. Whereas to be joyful and optimistic and have enthusiasm and fire and passion, that's seen as being a bit dumb or a bit silly or a bit, you know, it's not, it's not as clever to be loving and to be kind and to find hope and to look for the light and look for the better way to do things. Um, and so I think it's actually really hardcore to be me or to be someone like me, to have that hope and to have that idealism. I understand I am idealistic. I take that on the chin. It's okay to be idealistic. Things aren't ideal. And until they are, then I will continue to be idealistic. But I think particularly as a young girl, your hopes and dreams and your passion are seen as being silly or folly or foolish and you are squashed and you are shushed and I will not be squashed or shushed anymore. I will be optimistic, loudly optimistic because I think that if you've been somewhere in your life, very dark, very scary, you know, you're going to do everything to be where the light is, the good and the fire and the heat and the passion because you don't want anyone to be in that dark place. And you certainly don't want to share that, you know. It's a lot to do with that as well. There's so many levels to it. But I think, yeah, look, I mean, in the book, there's the posters in the book. And it's like hope is an energy. And something I say a lot as well is hope is a group project. And like the idea of hope being infectious. Or hope is like fleas. Pass it on. Pass it on. <laughs> and just keep passing it on. And it, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's quite powerful. It really is. Oh, to be honest with you, I think I've been fighting and rallying against apathy all my life. I think it's the thing I've, I've if you look at my work going back over the last 30 years, it's definitely, I mean, from early, early poems like Can't Be Bothered, where I wrote about, you know, sort of taking the mickey out of people that were like, can't be bothered, don't matter, whatever. And I'm kind of rallying against that. I think it's been a thread and a theme through my work all my life, this kind of idea of, yeah, of, of just sort of giving up before you've even tried and pushing things down when, you know, poo-pooing things when you're, um, you know, just because it's easier, like giving up is easy or telling people to give up. People who are telling other people to give up should get out of the way of people that are trying to do some good and trying to keep that hope going. You sort of look at literature and you kind of look at things like Handmaid's Tale or Margaret Atwood or if you look at 1984, George Orwell. And, um, and these books, which I adore and love. But in these books, they're imagining a world where the bad people have won. They're imagining a world where we've all completely lost it. We've lost any kind of hope. We've lost any kind of light or colour or passion or freedom. And, uh, and if writers and poets are investing in imagining a world where we, where we haven't even won, I think that's really telling as well. I want writers to write books where things work out, where 
we find a way. If we're not imagining it, even in our fiction, even in our poetry, even in our songs, if we aren't imagining that things can be better, then you've got to start somewhere. I believe everything starts with a sketch. Everything starts with a joke or an idea or something said in a pub over a pint or a dream. Everything starts with a dream or a hope or a little scribbled something. And then from there it grows and grows. Like when you imagine early man imagining wanting to fly, it all started with some people jumping off buildings with like feathers tied to their arm. But they just kept trying and trying, you know, and imagining flying. It all starts with someone scribbling and dreaming and wishing and hoping. And we've got to just remember that. Things don't start with some big, here is the solution, 100%, this is flying. You've got to have a bunch of people that are prepared to jump out of a tree first. I think all of this is important. I think protest is really important. I don't think anything got changed without some sort of protest or some sort of march or some sort of standing together and standing up and speaking up for things to be fair or f or more fair. Or, I think all of those things not, not just inform my work, but many people's work and many of the ways that we're thinking and the way that we're accepting or not accepting what's going on. Yeah. How how relevant is courage as a muscle? I don't know. It's a visualisation. If we can visualise, like I was saying earlier, hope as an energy or hope as a group project and then visualise courage as a muscle and what do you do to build that muscle? You keep building it and building it and working it. Again, we can't. We live in this um, society where we expect instant results, don't we? But everything takes work and like working together and hearing each other. I think it's so important, the idea that you're not just going to wake up with this fantastic, courageous muscle. You've got to build it and, and, and confirm it and work on it. And, you know, just as you would down the gym. Yeah, to get a six pack. Some kind of, I'm like, when I said that, sorry, when I said that, I was picturing some kind of hope gym, like, <laughs> kind of like, <laughs> like positivity gymnasium. Yeah. The poems are inspired by protests and rallies, and they celebrate courage, resistance, and hope. Godden's poems are powerful and moving, and they offer a message of resilience and strength in the face of adversity. The title poem, Pessimism is for Lightweights, sets the tone for the collection. In the poem, Godden argues that pessimism is a destructive force that prevents us from taking action and making a difference in the world. She writes, Pessimism is for lightweights. This road was never easy and straight, and living is all about living alive and lively, and love will conquer hate. Godden's poems are full of energy and passion. She writes about the importance of standing up for what you believe in, even when it's difficult. She also argues that courage is not something that we are born with, but rather something that we develop over time. Godden uses the metaphor of a muscle to illustrate her point, as she mentioned. Just as a muscle grows stronger with youth, so too does our courage. The more we face our fears and challenges, the stronger our courage becomes. The poem, Courage is a Muscle, is a call to action, urging us to be courageous in the face of adversity. In the poem, she writes... Courage is the muscle, we flex when we must. Courage is the muscle for truth and for trust. Godden also writes about the importance of community and solidarity. In her titular poem, she also adds, Then you're already winning at living. You speak up, you show up and stand tall. It's silence that is complicit. It's apathy that hurts us all. In the poem, The Letter, Godden writes a letter to the spirit of hope. She asks the spirit to help us in our fight for justice and equality. She writes, Home is just a marble in the sky. I roll it blue and green and I. Hope I am, and hope am I. See all that free sky up above. Live with hope, live with love, with love, hope. The poem is a reminder that hope is essential for change. When we have hope, we have the strength to keep fighting even when things are tough. In the day we stopped, she talks about the danger of us becoming apathetic. She says, one by one we stop shouting and kicking and fighting and running away, eventually falling silent. Hence, her poems are a call to never stop fighting and always pursue justice. Our next book is from veteran journalist, Emmy Award winning filmmaker and activist Danny Schechter, who is the author of 14 books. Schechter has produced and directed 30 documentaries and TV specials. 
He was also the editor of MediaChannel1.org and wrote a daily blog as News Dissector before he passed away in 2015. Occupy. Dissecting Occupy Wall Street looks up when the activists moved into Zuccotti Park near Manhattan's Wall Street in 2011, following the financial crash. OWS activists championed social and economic justice, sparking similar Occupy movements in 1,000 cities around the world. Here he is speaking to Deep Dish TV. You know, other people telling you uh, what to think and what to do. And, and this is why, in some ways, this movement, uh, you know, is re reshaping what politics could be by having a very bottom-up approach, very democratic process, uh, a, a very anti-leader orientation. Now, that fit well with today's media culture, where everybody wants a spokesperson, everybody in the media, you know, wants a, wants a message point and a slogan, not 10,000 message points and slogans. But nevertheless, this, you know, uh, this gathering here, encampment, call it what you will, started getting very hostile media, first started getting no media coverage. Then it started getting cynical and sarcastic media coverage, hostile, ha, 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 I'm in a man down there named Germ, ha, 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 you know, in the New York Times. But then, as this thing went on, the, the tone has changed. Uh, yesterday in the New York Times, on the business pages, they were saying, you know, it's maturing. They were saying, you know, it's now about a corporate accountability. Once they found their own words to put on it, they felt more comfortable with it. And so what we're seeing now is many world media outlets reporting this as an important expression of discontent in America. Occupy Wall Street's forebears included the 2011 Tahrir Square demonstrations in Cairo and the Puerta del Sol protests in Madrid. Pro-democracy Egyptian activists gathered in mass demonstrations in the square, which became the focal point and the symbol of increasingly popular protests in the city. Eventually, millions took part. They demanded democracy, economic justice, and substantial changes in Egypt's government. Spurred by their activism, Egypt's military forces ousted the nation's longtime corrupt dictator Hosni Mubarak. Later that year, Spanish protesters gathered in Puerta del Sol, a prominent square in the heart of Madrid. These activists, known as Indignados, transformed Puerta del Sol into their own Tahrir Square. They called their grassroots protest movement Real Democracy. As happened in Cairo, the traditional and online media heavily publicized the massive protests which became known as the May 15th or M15 movement. Their numbers included disillusioned youth, the unemployed, pensioners, students, immigrants and other disenfranchised groups. They demanded reasonably priced housing, jobs, a responsive government and an end to corruption. The M15 activists set up tents and other ad hoc structures in Puerto del Sol, creating a new temporary village. No one led the group. The indignados prefer to be leaderless and to make consensus decisions. Activist Pablo Uziel proudly proclaimed, Spanish direct democracy is still alive and has finally awakened. These pro-democracy demonstrations served as precursors to the smaller Occupy Wall Street or OWS movement. On September 17, 2011, a handful of OWS activists occupied Zuccotti Park, also known as Liberty Square, a concrete park near Wall Street. After the initial occupiers had a few widely publicised squabbles with the New York Police Department, thousands of people joined their ranks, and Zuccotti Park became the centre of Occupy Wall Street. Like the Spanish protesters, the OWS activists wanted no formal leaders. They relied on a collective process which they called the People's Assembly to make decisions. The group summed up its mission in the documents of the New York General Assembly of Occupy Wall Street. It proclaimed that on September 17, 2011, people from all over the United States of America and the world came to protest the blatant injustices of our times, perpetuated by the economic and political elites. On the 17th, we as individuals rose up against political disenfranchisement and social and economic injustice. We spoke out, resisted, and successfully occupied Wall Street. However, like the Egyptian protesters, OWS activists did not present and never developed a specific list of demands. The media, including reporters from all over the world, covered OWS activities daily. 
OWS quickly became front page news. Copycat Occupy groups demonstrated their solidarity by meeting in cities around the US, including San Francisco, Los Angeles and Chicago, and around the world, notably in London, Tokyo, Stuttgart and Athens. Activists mounted similar protests initially in some 70 cities and eventually in a thousand or more cities across the globe. While most OWS activists were in their 20s, their ranks included older people, particularly white-collar workers who had lost their jobs during the recession. Celebrities such as filmmaker Michael Moore, actress Susan Sarandon and Ivy League professor Cornell West visited the activists to show support. Members of US labour unions also went to Zuccotti Park to express their solidarity with OWS activists, or as they put it, to back up the kids. OWS protesters living in the park found they had to be constantly vigilant regarding the NYPD. The activists believed that the cops assembled in and around their encampment sought any pretext to shut down the demonstrations and their impromptu village. However, many of the younger members of the police department, in marked contrast to their supervisors, became friendly with the activists. Some directly offered words of encouragement and support. At the same time, police routinely arrested protesters. One activist developed a box score of arrests by the 10th day of the protest. OWS protesters arrested 121 to 200. Wall Street banksters arrested zero. The press coverage of OWS activities often assumed a sneering tone, yet the encampment's persistence impressed some usually cynical reporters. Nathan Schneider of the website Reader Supported News advocated giving OWS some credibility when he wrote, For many Americans, Nonviolent direct actions like this occupation are the best hope for having a political voice and they deserve to be taken seriously as such. Eventually, most members of the press stopped ridiculing the OWS activists and some of them became openly admiring. The New York Times columnists were mostly supportive. However, conservative outlets never relented and on-air commentators at Fox News were openly disdainful. Conservative author Ann Coulter compared the OWS protesters to Nazis. The Daily Bell website and the Drudge Report, amid other conservative media outlets, depicted the activists as uninformed. Drudge ran a prison planet piece stating, Despite their honest intentions, many of the Occupy Wall Street protesters are being suckered into a trap and calling for the very solutions that are part of the financial elite's agenda to torpedo the American middle class, higher taxes, and more big government. The Occupy point of view criticised the right-leaning media for overlooking the massive government bailout of Wall Street, expensive subsidies to financial institutions and Wall Street professionals, outrageous compensation packages. OWS objected to the policies of the Federal Reserve, railed against fraud on Wall Street leading up to the 2008 financial collapse, and insisted that the mortgage crisis was a direct result of the notorious redlining of minority neighbourhoods during the 80s and the 90s, which made it extremely difficult for African Americans to purchase homes. Some mainstream reporters and columnists demonstrated little sympathy for OWS protesters. Washington Post columnist Richard Cohen wrote, No one this side of the moon knows precisely what the Occupy Wall Street movement is trying to do. On a daily basis, it marches off to some location to highlight what we all know, that Wall Street guys are rich, and their slogan suggests a tired socialism that is as repugnant to me as a felonious capitalism that produced the impoverishment of millions of Americans. OWS's critics pointed out that it lacked a specific agenda for improving American society. But OWS's lack of specificity was a great strength, because providing a definitive detailed list of grievances would have cost its supporters who might have found one item or another that they could not uphold. By keeping its programme general, OWS lined up broad-based support. Zuccotti Park, named after a legendary figure in New York's real estate industry, is a single city block long. The Occupy movement provoked tremendous activity in the area, such as the coming and going of food trucks and police vans. The NYPD built a surveillance tower to aid in monitoring the occupation. Activists had to deal with mundane concerns such as locating missing sleeping bags, cleaning the camp, cooking and sending out social media postings from their laptops. Someone even developed an iPad app for the Occupy Wall Street. Most Wall Streeters stayed silent about the protests. Many visited the park at lunchtime to watch the OWS activists, as if they were viewing animals at the zoo. 
On September 27th, the owner of Zuccotti Park reportedly planned to petition the courts to evict the occupiers. However, polls showed that New Yorkers supported OWS by a 3 to 1 ratio. OWS activists feared that the Democratic Party would try to co opt their positions and thus water down the impact of their demonstrations. David Plouffe, a White House advisor, contacted some of the OWS so called leaders to discuss their movement. The activists were concerned that the White House would try to divide and conquer OWS. Republican Congressman Eric Cantor blamed President Barack Obama for the Occupy protest, calling the occupiers mobs. If Cantor had visited the park, he might have been quite surprised to learn that OWS activists regarded Obama as a disguised Republican who fully supported Wall Street. The OWS campaigners routinely attacked all politicians, Republicans and Democrats alike. OWS activists were reluctant to demand policy changes or anything else from politicians. In making a demand, you're essentially recognising the authority of the people who are going to carry it out, activist David Graeber said during an Al Jazeera interview. Our message is that the system that we have is broken. It doesn't work. OWS quickly deflated some common myths. The first was that it was impossible to sustain protests and demonstrations against the heart of the world's monetary power apparatus. The second was that New York City is the capital of liberal America. OWS disproved the falsehood that police violence does not occur in the US and the canard that liberals, conservatives and libertarians couldn't come together to protest the abuses of the 1% against the 99%. In mid-October, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg spent five minutes wandering through Zuccotti Park. He described it as filthy and told reporters that the police would close the park for a cleaning. OWS protesters interpreted cleaning as clearing. They organised an army of volunteer cleaners to scrub up the park. The New York Times headline read, We spruced up the park, now can we stay? As a result of the protesters' efforts, the NYPD did not, at that moment, close the park. The police acted on November 15th when Bloomberg ordered the NYPD, who were dressed in full riot gear, to clear the OWS protesters out of the park. Although OWS issued a statement declaring, You can't evict an idea whose time has come, NYPD carried out the removal. It occurred shortly after officials in Portland, Oregon and Oakland, California evicted their Occupy protesters from their city's local public parks. OWS supporters suspected that a coordinated municipal counteroffensive was underway to shut down their movement across the country. The New York City tabloids wrote ecstatic headlines about the eviction. Beat it, said the Daily News. Stories in the New York Post celebrated the shutdown with the same tone the paper used to describe a New York sports victory. Two days after the eviction, on November 17th, OWS protesters tried to close the New York Stock Exchange. In response, police went back to Zuccotti Park and attacked people there, including reporters, spraying protesters with mace and beating them with their nightsticks. The police arrested many people. Across the US, municipal officials mustered police power to shut down local Occupy movements. However, Occupy protesters continued to demonstrate and march. Their protests are unlikely to translate into political action because the movement is radical, anarchistic and leaderless, unstable ingredients for a viable political movement. Occupy Wall Street was not merely an urban camping foray. Activists launched it as a crusade to fight for equity and justice. Its leaders know that it must develop creative methods for reaching the 99%. Official OWS documents sum up its message. We are daring to imagine a new socio-political and economic alternative that offers greater possibility of equality. So to sum up, Godin says in Pessimism is for Lightweights that you are not alone and there is always hope for a better future. The poems are inspired by protests and rallies, and they celebrate courage, resistance and hope. Godin's poems are powerful and moving, and they offer a message of resilience and strength in the face of adversity. The poems were written for the Women's March, for women's empowerment and amplification. Poems that salute people fighting for justice. Poems on sexism and racism, class discrimination, period poverty and homelessness, immigration and identity. This work reminds us that courage is a muscle. It also contains a letter from the spirit of hope herself, because as the title suggests, pessimism is for lightweights. In Schechter's book, Occupy, he argues that Occupy Wall Street was a success because it raised awareness of the growing gap between the rich and the poor, and inspired a new generation of activists. 
He also argues that the movement's decentralized structure made it difficult for the media and the government to control. He says that Occupy Wall Street's leaderless movement challenged the corporate takeover of our democracy. He added that the movement's tactics and strategies were innovative and effective, and that it had a lasting impact on American politics and culture. Protest is important because it challenges the status quo. It is an act of patriotism to improve an unjust system contrary to what many nationalists believe. There are currently several decentralised movements, including Extinction Rebellion and the Black Lives Matter movement. Please join in on the conversation by following at How to Be 24 7 on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and subscribe on the podcast, which can be found via www.howtobe247.com and all major platforms. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and you want to be featured. Remember to check out the Patreon for exclusive unseen bonus material from every single interview or for a price of a coffee. And don't forget to check out the new website. See you in two weeks time.